If you will, open in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. As you turn there, consider the, the advice of Paul to the young evangelist Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 3 through 5 in particular are perhaps verses that we can all relate to. Perhaps, maybe not. But in a different way, whether by blood or by being a father or grandfather or mother or grandmother in the faith, perhaps there are many who have made a mark on our life teaching us who God is and what it means to be a servant, a child of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, Paul says, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers, day and night. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Consider this morning that gift in verse 6 that Paul bestowed upon Timothy. Many speculate that in verse 7 the idea of a spirit not of fear and power, love, and self-control is spiritual miraculous gifts. But that doesn't seem to add up based on the idea of love and self-discipline, as some translations may render it, control or sobriety, the true Greek meaning of the last word in verse 7. But in verse 6, when you think about what gift would he have laid on in, or into Timothy, it would have been the idea of revelation, the ability to teach, the, avail the availability and the ability that Timothy had to make a mark on the New Testament church in a unique way. But it's not just because he had the revelation of God that he was made in a particular way. I think verse 7 is important to see. God gave us, not just Paul and Timothy, this applies to us as well. God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. We see by that in many other passages that when we are made by God, when in Genesis chapter 1 says we are made in his image, with the ability to think, to decipher between right and wrong, to choose righteousness and reject evil. We know that we were made unique, special in the sight of God and by our great God. And that carries a heavy burden, a heavy weight, because it means we are made to impact something. We are made to make a difference in this life. And perhaps most importantly, most pertinently to Paul, to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, we are made to make a difference in the lives of others as it per pertains to learning about God. Whether it be through our family, as in verse 5, the, Timothy's grandmother Lois or mother Eunice, whether it be a friend or a co-worker, we are made to impact others. But certainly those characteristics that drive us in evangelism and in our love for one another go beyond just the scope of teaching about God. When you think about not having a spirit of fear, not being, uh, giving in to cowardice, or choosing to have power, love, and self-control, that would impact every area of our lives. If we truly had the faith that Timothy did, if we had the resolve and the courage that Paul had, what a difference we would make. What a wonderful group this could be. And as we consider 2 Timothy chapter 1 this morning, I want to focus in on verse 7 in particular. And I want to speak about how God made us in a unique way. How we were not made, first of all, with a spirit of fear. And this is despite suffering, despite persecution. As I was studying for this lesson, I was... I was amazed at what I found in 2 Timothy. Look at these verses with me, beginning in chapter 1 and verse 8, the very next verse. Note how many times Paul tells Timothy to be ready for suffering, to expect persecution, that this can and will come. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8, beginning. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us, and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. He says in verse 8, don't be ashamed about your testimony. Don't be ashamed of the Lord, who has done everything for you, in particular verse 9. But as the middle of verse 8 says, share in suffering for the gospel, which is the power of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, read the first four verses with me. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. 
Again, in verse 3, we find the idea, share in suffering, this time specified or given an example as a good soldier in Christ Jesus. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from all of them I endured. All of them the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Over and over, Paul is telling Timothy with perhaps the last uh, letter he wrote, with perhaps the last epistle, the, the last letter entirety that Paul would have authored in the New Testament. He's telling Timothy in verse, thir- in verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This is despite the fact that verse 13 tells us that evil people and imposters, they're going to continue to go on. It's going to look fine. It's going to look great for them. But in verse 12, for Christians, for Timothy, who is devoted uniquely to the teaching of the gospel message, he would experience persecution. Even in chapter 4, you have this idea of persecutions laid out in verses 1 through 5, perhaps the most well-known section in in this book. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. How many times does Paul have to tell Timothy that he will suffer for teaching Christ? That he will be persecuted because of his faith, because of his mission? And then I have to consider, is that not the mission for all Christians? That we stand out in a world of darkness. That we are so different that the world hates us. That as verse 12 says, we all who live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All the while in verse 13, the evil people seem to be prospering and going on. We were not given a spirit of fear despite the suffering and persecution. The words of chapter 1 of Paul to Timothy saying God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power, love, and self-control take place even when life is difficult, even when we're suffering, even when we're being persecuted for our faith. But before we even get there, before we think about the evangelistic angle, before we even think about what it means to not give in to cowardice or fear, I want to consider for a moment, do we believe that 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12 is true and is inspired by God? I'll read it again. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Do we believe that was just for Timothy? Just for the first century Christians? I don't think it's fair to reason that way, to take one verse that we feel uncomfortable with and to say that that doesn't apply to me. And so I have to ask myself first, as I'm living in this wonderful country that affords us unique blessings and unique protections in the name of religion, what have I suffered for Christ? What have I given up in seeking a godly life, a God-first life? And if I haven't been persecuted, if I haven't suffered, Why is that? Might it be that it's coming and I need to be prepared, that I need to read the words of life and make sure I stay on that narrow way? That's possible, but it's more likely that I'm not living the true godly life. Because if we look around and say the world is waxing worse and worse, people are going their own way, they're ignoring the wisdom of God, and I just keep on and I'm doing okay, that tells me we're not doing it right. Not because God will punish those who are seeking after him, but because when we desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, we will be so different it will cause friction with the enemy. And we know that our adversary, the devil, is out and about, roaming around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If my life is going comfortably and I'm not being persecuted or suffering in any way, am I truly doing what God wants of me? That doesn't mean to become a martyr. 
That doesn't mean go out and make sure you say things that annoy people and then they throw tomatoes at you. But it does mean that we need to make sure that we don't give in to fear and we don't set aside our Christian faith in certain circumstances so that it doesn't cause a problem. That would be giving in to the spirit of fear that God did not give us. Cowardice is unacceptable to God. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, as we consider the words of Revelation 21 and verse 8, consider the very first, the very first description given in verse 8, at least as we have it rendered in many of our translations. In verse 8, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This is a who's who of who we don't expect to be in heaven with God. And we know from this verse they will not be, but note in verse 8, after cowardly, it is the faithless, as the English Standard Version renders it, the detestable, the murderers. The cowardly are lumped in with the detestable, the murderers, and the faithless. That tells me there's something to Timothy's warning from Paul, Timothy's exhortation from Paul, to not give in to a spirit of fear, recognize that that's not from God or for God. And that tells me that I must be proactive in my faith, bold in what God has delivered. And we're going to see how we do that. God has given us exactly the spirit we need to overcome fear with the power, love, and self-control we will certainly talk about in just a moment. But we were not given a spirit of fear despite suffering, in light of possible persecution, or despite the fact that this life is hard and this life is long. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10 with me. You can turn to Hebrews chapter 10 because we're also going to look at chapter 12 shortly after. In Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 36, Note the Hebrew writer's advice, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. What is the differentiating factor? Those who please God are those who do not shrink back. Those who are not marked by fear. Who will receive the promise? Verse 36, those who endure. Those who have done the will of God. It cannot be both ways. If we are to please God, if we are going to endure in this life, we will not be afraid, but we will be bold for God because He has done everything for us. If we say we want to be with Him, if we are looking for the reward, verse 39 says what? We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. If I want to have faith, I cannot be marked by fear. And the Bible says there are no two ways about that. If I haven't suffered, I have to wonder how much have I truly looked into what it means to be righteous and holy. The world persecuted Jesus. The Israelites certainly continued time after time to persecute the prophets. The New Testament Christians were persecuted time and again. Do we think that in the 21st century that the persecution and sufferings that they face don't apply to us anymore? We're missing the mark, and we're underestimating the devil if we believe that. Consider with me chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. That that note on endurance tells us that it's going to take perseverance, that it is difficult, not just in momentary circumstances, but to have boldness, faith, that to take on the attributes of power, love, and self-control is a lifelong pursuit that takes great perseverance, great endurance, chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. What does Hebrews chapter 12 tell us? Yes, we need to look to Jesus. Yes, he is the author and perfecter of our faith. We need to look to Jesus to get through this life. But it tells us that if we're going to be like Jesus, we need to have endurance. What does endurance tell me? That this life is long and hard for many of God's creation. Endurance isn't necessary when it's easy. Although I do have to say, sometimes it is hard to sit back and watch 12 hours of college football on a Saturday. I tend to make it through here and there. You think I'm joking, but I really go for that. 
as we think about endurance, it's generally when it's something that's difficult for us, something that we have to work hard to overcome, that we have to persevere. And we note verses 3 and 4, what was unique about Jesus' perseverance, his endurance? Not only did he endure from a time perspective, but no, more importantly, more to the point. In verse 3, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. In verse 4, in our struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So the Hebrew writer is telling the Hebrew recipients of this letter. You have not yet resisted enough in your struggle. I have to ask, where is my struggle? And just for a moment, I want to think, where could that struggle come from? Is it family? Is it at the office? Is it just down the street? If I'm staying in my box and staying to myself, I won't have too much trouble. I may have internal thoughts. I may have to deal with my own personal sins. And certainly that will take endurance to overcome. But if we're going to be bold, if we're not going to be cowardly like those who find themselves in Revelation 21 and verse 8 with the faithless, detestable, and murderers and sexually immoral, then I need to make a difference in this life because I know God made me that way. And the good news is if God doesn't expect us to give in to fear, he would have given us and laid out for us expectations of how to live. We see the first of those back in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, that we are to serve with great power or strength. Of course, where does that power originate? Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. Verse 17, for in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. As we look at verse 16, we see not only is the gospel the power of God and his salvation, but Paul says, I am not ashamed. I am not fearful. I am not bashful. Verse 17, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. How shall the righteous live? The righteous shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. We have to have great strength and power, and that power luckily isn't dependent upon us. Our God has blessed us with the tools to make this a reality. Perhaps 2 Timothy chapter 1 seems to be directly to Timothy, but turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Note Paul's warning, Paul's exhortation to the Corinthians. A passage we don't look at too often. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, except when it comes to the collection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, noting in verse 12, beginning. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 12. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers. But it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Note with me verse 13 and 14. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Be strong. That is a commandment that Paul is laying forth for the Corinthians. That is a goal to which they must aspire to. They're not only to be watchful, to stand firm in the faith, but to be strong and to do so in love. Let everything they have done and continue to do be done in love. We are to serve with great strength, but our God has delivered us exactly what we need for boldness. How is that the gospel is the power of God? It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And that is a wonderful blessing. But when I think about how can I overcome fear? How can I make sure I'm not among the cowardice that will be in the lake of fire? How does that power help me? How does that give me strength? Well, first of all, if the, if the power of God into salvation, if the fact that we can be washed from our sins ever becomes old news or old hat, we will not make it. We won't have the endurance to set aside all the, the sin which clings so closely because we don't care anymore. The only thing God has offered us is everything that matters. That is forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ's sacrificed son. That can never become old. That has to be the center of our faith. And then it becomes the center of our boldness. Because if we can be forgiven, if we can be with God, then what is it that matters? Obeying and pleasing that God. That means I will sacrifice for him because I know what he has done for me, how he sacrificed Jesus on my behalf. It means that I will talk to others about the good news of salvation because I am joyful and honestly thankful for what God has done for me. And I have to think about myself and how I tend to be sometimes shy, particularly when it comes to people I don't really know well, that I see in random places. If I'm unwilling to share with them the good news of the gospel message, the power of God and the salvation, not only do, am I showing a lack of care and love for them, a point we'll get to in just a moment, 
but perhaps I'm showing a lack of gratefulness and thankfulness for what God has done for me. Because when we are excited about something, we'll tell everyone who will listen. How excited are we about what Jesus has done for us? How excited and thankful are we for what our God has blessed us with? The opportunity to be with him forever. That has to be life-changing. That has to be what we need. In fact, we see in Ephesians chapter 6, of course, when it pertains to the armor of God, God does give us what we need. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put, the, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Why does it keep telling us in 1 Corinthians 16 and Ephesians 6, stand firm in the faith, stand what? Against the schemes of the devil. We have to have power and strength we have to take on the armor of God because he is trying to knock us down. The devil, the tempter, the great adversary is looking to knock us over. But in verse 10, I want to key in on one more phrase. Yes, we are to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Where does that strength derive from? We are to be strong in the Lord, strong in his might. Our strength will only come from the proper source. The strength that will allow us to stand in verse 11 to stand against the, the principles that go beyond flesh and blood in verse 12. The only way we will be able to stand is if we are strong in the Lord and in his mind. We're going to see how that pertains to us when it comes to self-control, self-discipline. But keep in mind that if we are going to stand, it is only if we trust in the Lord. Consider with me, secondly, we are to serve with compassionate love. Of course, remember back in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and love and self-control. We have to have a love that cares for others, not only in teaching of the gospel, as Ephesians 4.15 says, but in all things. Look first with me in Ephesians chapter 4, though. Consider certainly this would have direct application with Timothy. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. When we talk about edification, I'm not sure that we often emphasize the last part of verse 16. How is the body to grow together? Not just with the teachings, but the teachings that are melded together and grow in love. How is this love to be shown? Well, in verse 15, first of all, we have to have compassion to show the gospel message with others. We have to love them the way that Jesus has loved the whole world to come and die on the cross for our sins. Remember Romans chapter 5, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I look at sinners, I look at people and I say, they won't listen. I'm not going to try. That doesn't show the love of God. It certainly doesn't show the love of Christ. And when we share the gospel message, it can't be, you know what, I'm going to hammer them with these facts that I know to be true, and if they don't take it, that's on them. I think the parable of the sower is very important for us to remember in evangelism, that yes, it is our job to sow the seed, and that there are different soils, there will be different reactions, and it's not the seed's fault, and it's not particularly the sower's fault. But as we think about evangelism, and we look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, look again, rather speaking the truth in love. We have to do better than just hammering people and saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, look at what's right, get it. We have to be willing to speak the truth in love. I, I am a perhaps more quarrelsome person than most when it comes to learning style. I like to ask questions. I like to play devil's advocate. That's why I gave Bob a run for his money in answering questions. I love to ask him, well, what do these people think about that? And he'd say, well, I don't, really, I don't really know what these people think about that. But when we think about how we like to learn, for the most part, no one here likes to be belittled and told their faith is dumb, pointless, and wrong. But we have to speak with love recognizing that, yes, there is truth that must be taught. We can't be cowardice. We can't be fearful. We have to teach the truth in its entirety, but do so in love, with mercy, with grace. Jesus certainly was no friend to the Pharisees, but he often would teach his message. He would rebuke them when they deserved to be rebuked, but he also died for them just as he did for us. We need to have that compassionate love. In John chapter 13, though, that love that should emanate through a Christian's life goes beyond just evangelism. In John chapter 13, consider the magnitude of the love of Christ, the love of God. In John 13 and verse 31, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, 
and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment, verse 34, I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, verse 35, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Not only is the magnitude and the scope of our love to be like Christ, which is completely and 100% sacrificial, I want to key in on verse 35 for a moment. In our spirits of evangelism, in our service, recognizing that we were made to make a difference in this life, verse 35, what does true love do? By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. Christians should be easy to pick out because we should be seen by our love, a love that emanated first from Jesus the Christ. First from our holy and blameless God who created us, who gave us free will, and even gave us a plan of salvation when we directly transgressed against his law. Our God is great. Our God is merciful. Our God is gracious and loving. And we must be too. Consider with me finally. If we're made to make a difference, we are to serve with self-discipline, self-control, depending on your translation in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. If we are going to do that, if we're going to take on the power of God, not give in to the fear, if we're going to be characterized by love, speaking the truth in love, caring for others, having compassionate love that is all sacrificial, and again, not giving in to the fear of their reactions, we must first regularly study the word, whether it's the noble Bereans in Acts 17 and verse 11 who searched the scriptures to see if the things that were taught were so, or the blessed man in Psalm chapter 1 whose delight is in the law of the Lord and he meditates on it day and night. We will not access the strength of the Lord. We will not be strong in the Lord or in the strength of his might if we don't read his word. We won't do it. We won't make it. If we think we're going to endure this life, if we're going to make it through the sufferings and the persecutions that will come to those who are desiring to live a godly life in Christ Jesus our Lord, we must regularly study on and feast upon the words of life. If I'm not doing that, if we are not doing that, we're kidding ourselves because we won't make it. Jesus prayed to God multiple times in multiple ways, whether it was by himself, whether it was with his disciples, whether it was in his hour of tribulation or before a meal. Jesus was often found in prayer to God. I'm amazed and disappointed in myself at how often I can go without being characterized by prayer like Jesus was. Jesus, the perfect man on this earth, the perfect savior for this world. He prayed to God. He submitted to his will. How can I possibly think that I can get through this life without that relationship with God that Jesus had? If Jesus needed that prayer with God, if he made time to speak with his heavenly father, then I both know that I must to obey and be pleasing to God, but I must if I'm going to endure I have to practice self-discipline. I have to make sure that I make time for not just quantity of prayer, but quality time with my Heavenly Father. I wonder if we stop thinking about prayer as a wish list and God as a wish-granting genie and more of our Heavenly Father, the idea that Jesus had, how often and how different our prayers would be. Would we not pray more? Would we not spend more time praising God, thanking God, than just asking him to get me through another pinch. It is a blessing of God that he wants to be heard, that he wants us to lay up our struggles and trials upon him. That is a blessing, and we should take advantage of that. But we also must always thank our God and give him the glory that he and he alone, as creator of this earth and sustainer of this life, deserves. Our God is great. We should regularly study his word. We should practice self-control when it comes to time and prayer. Thirdly, we should spend time with Christians. If we're going to have endurance if we're going to have power, if we're going to access the strength of the Lord, if we're going to have love, we need to sharpen one another. We need to be as iron sharpens iron. We need to take advantage of the love that other Christians show towards us in the sense that we learn what it means to be sacrificial. We learn what it means to strive after Jesus, what it means to be a Christian. It means to surround ourselves with good, to hate the evil, to cling to what is good. And this is a unique blessing of God that we can be together, strengthen one another, feed on the word and pray together and worship our God. This is a blessing we must not let slip through our fingers. We have to be spending time with Christians if we expect to make it through this life. And finally, we need to be ready for the Lord. Time and again in the New Testament, Paul wrote 
and the New Testament writers wrote about the coming of the Lord, that we need to be prepared. We need to be ready. How are we ready? We need to make sure our life isn't characterized by fear, that we recognize that suffering and persecution can and will come, but that we will overcome because we are with God. We will overcome because God did not make us with a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. Will you go to God in prayer with me? Our dear God and most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day you have once again blessed us with. Thank you for being our creator, our sustainer, our everything. We pray that you forgive us of our sins and any, anything that which might hinder our prayers to you. We pray that you forgive us of times when we're not bold as we should, when we give in to cowardice and fear, when we don't exercise the power that you offer, the love that you exemplified, and the self-control we must have to endure and to be pleasing to you. Help us to take on these attributes. Help us to recognize that you have given us the picture of which we are to model after. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, giving us not only an example of a sinless life, but of one devoted to you and one who died so that we might be forgiven and can live. Thank you for all of your blessings. Keep us safe through this day. Help us to be pleasing in your sight. It's in your son's name we do pray. Amen. We're now dismissed to our Bible classes.